there's ongoing business in life when you know you're dying. And you've got to take care of it. Because I think that people's fear of death isn't the fear of the dying so much as fear of leaving things undone. It's really the incomplete life that is so fearful. Death is, is just part of the bargain of living. The Completed Life Initiative presents... Voices of the Completed Life. In each episode, we share unprecedented conversations at the heart of the human experience. Our hosts dive into honest dialogue about mortality, loss, and grief, as we hear firsthand from individuals who seek to avoid life-limiting maladies in a body that may no longer serve them, and who instead aim to celebrate their lives as completed. These are stories that may challenge and surprise you. These stories are worth listening to. These are Voices of the Completed Life. Our host for this episode, Sarah Kiskadden Bechtel, MBE, is the inaugural program director for the Completed Life Initiative, who brings with her 13 years of experience in bioethics. Ms. Kiskadden Bechtel is an innovative and strategic problem solver who has devoted her career to untangling oft misunderstood and oft stigmatized issues at the heart of human experience. Her expertise ranges from researching the impact of cultural traditions on the spread of HIV AIDS in Swaziland to facilitating a CDC award-winning clinical research study in tuberculosis control at New York City public health clinics. In addition to directing the Completed Life Initiative, Sarah teaches as associate faculty in the Masters of Bioethics program at Columbia University, serves as a member of the Carson Tahoe Health Institutional Review Board, is editor-in-chief emeritus of Voices in Bioethics, an online journal, and is a member of the Empire State Bioethics Consortium. In this episode of Voices of the Completed Life, we interviewed Linda Shannon Bluestein. Linda is a Connecticut woman who recently won the right to access medical aid in dying in court under Vermont's Act 39. Prior to Linda's decision to sue Vermont, she received a terminal cancer diagnosis in 2021, which followed two prior battles with cancer dating back to 2019. Linda's desire to seek out medical aid in dying is motivated by her wish to live a life she sees as complete, and she has created her own checklist for what she values most as she nears the end of her life. Prior to the historic Bluestein settlement, Vermont's Act 39 was limited only to Vermont residents, a requirement that is true in almost every jurisdiction in the United States where medical aid in dying is legal. The exception being Oregon, where a settlement was reached in the case of Gideons v. Brown. As a result, the state of Oregon, the Oregon Health Authority, the Oregon Medical Board, and the Multnomah County District Attorney have stated that they will not enforce the residency requirement of the Oregon Death with Dignity Act. However, legislation to remove residency requirements from the law altogether have not yet been passed. In this podcast interview, we will hear Linda's firsthand account of receiving her terminal diagnosis. We will also explore how she found her unique role in right-to-die advocacy, including when she met her co-plaintiff in the Vermont case, Dr. Diana Barnard, a Vermont-based physician, and connected with the advocacy organization Compassion and Choices, who helped file the lawsuit on Linda's behalf. We will conclude with a discussion about Linda's upbringing, where she gained her beliefs about death, and her death plan, which she intends to complete by the time she accesses medical aid in dying. We now turn to Sarah Kiskadden Bechtel's conversation with Linda Shannon Bluestein. What started at the beginning? What originally got you involved or interested in medical aid and dying? So I didn't get introduced to Dr. Barnard until I had come home from the hospital. And my husband, who has uh, been offering testimony in Connecticut for years, working with Compassion and Choices because he's an MD, and they couldn't find an MD to actually testify. So he had been doing that. He said to me, 
what do you think about maybe being the patient? And he could have choked it out. And I said, you mean like Kim Hoffman? You know, she had just died. And compassion choices, she had been their terminally ill patient who was such a powerful uh, proponent of medical aid and dying for our own state. I said, you tell her yes. And so he wrote to Kim Callanan and said, my wife, Linda, has this terminal diagnosis and, and wants to uh, be part of advocating for medical aid and dying. That's how I got involved. And then I met Diana over Zoom when we both were talking about filing this lawsuit, like, you know, suing the state of Vermont, the governor and the attorney general, which I thought was very bold. That was very me. So I was, I was all over that lawsuit. And I said, this is a legacy I would want to leave. There's ongoing business in life when you know you're dying and you've got to take care of it. Because I think that people's fear of death isn't the fear of the dying so much as fear of leaving things undone. It's really the incomplete life that is so fearful. So I, I, I wanted to finish up a promise I had made to a friend. And my friend's name was Kathy, and she had stage four lung cancer. And we'd met back in 2019 when uh, I had breast cancer, she had lung cancer. And we had taken Qigong classes together at the Dorma Frame Center. And in the late fall of 2021, we met up at the farmer's market in Fairfield. And she came over to me and said, Linda, I haven't even told my family, but in December, I'm going to go to Vermont and I'm going to take Act 39. And I said, Kath, what is it? She says, my daughter won't talk to me about it. My son refuses to accept it. My husband too. But I can't deal with this any longer. I, it isn't, isn't four years enough. We talked and she came over to visit me and we, we just talked for hours about what that would mean for her. And so um, she said, I'm going to write to you every day. You're going to want to do this too. I know you. And I said, yes, I am. She said, I will send you an email every day on, so that you can get this done. So she wrote me December 2nd, driving to Vermont. You know, the next few days, got my driver's license, registered to vote, you know, got a few packages sent from Amazon to this address, you know, had my records sent, you know, saw a doctor. So she's she's just chronicling all the steps you have to go through, you know, to get to access um, aid and dying in Vermont. And this is a state where it's legal already. And then came the most difficult part, not the most form or the cold form of the medical, you know, certification that she was indeed hospice eligible, but getting just two random people to sign on a form saying, yes, you know, Kathy's of sound mind. And yes, she's made this decision freely. You know, she was at a coffee shop and she kept talking to people and they said, no, 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 I don't want to sign that. I want the government to know. And she, she had another guy who was, you know, picking up her trash every day. She said, would you sign this? No, 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 no. I don't want to do that. She finally found someone, the last person at the coffee shop, and they signed, and then nobody else would. So she left, walked down the street, just as fun. She didn't have any breath left. She couldn't, walked into a bookstore. And as soon as she walked in, she burst into tears. And apparently the owner of the bookstore came over and put her arms around her and said, what is it? And Kathy said, I need someone just to sign this form so that I can die. And the bookstore owner signed her form. And then that was the last step. And then she was able to find a hospice nurse to move in with. He and his wife had a house. She, he said, I'll cook for you and I'll clean for you and I'll do your laundry. And, and so he took her down to the place to get her prescription filled. And then her family had come together and realized that, that why were they holding on to her when her life was so horrible? And, and she was ready to go. So, um, she, she had written me another email. She said, um, think about tomorrow about 10 a.m. I'm going to take flight tonight. My spirituality group is going to meet on Zoom and we're going to have our last conversations. And my son, my daughter, my husband, you're all here. And then uh, the next morning on February 3rd of 2022, uh, she wrote, um, 10 a.m., light a candle, I'm taking flight. And then uh, a week later in Fairfield, uh, we had a memorial service. Her family had a memorial service in the in the Pinfield Pavilion down in Fairfield Beach, where we met and where Kathy and I spent many happy hours walking. And the place was packed. 
and people just talked about how wonderful it was to be on that Zoom call with her the night that she died. And her son and her daughter said it was the most beautiful thing. And they saw finally peace on their mother's face that they hadn't seen in really a couple of years. She'd been in all these clinical trials and going back and forth to Memorial Sloan Kettering until she couldn't take it anymore. At what point did you decide to follow Kathy's lead to Vermont? I now have my roadmap to Vermont. And then when the opportunity came to maybe get out of that other step of the residency requirement, that's when I met Dr. Barnard and all the met the legal team from Compassion and Choices so that I could take charge too. I, Without any hesitation, I said yes. And that's what Kathy wanted. But Kathy made me promise to carry on her work. You know, she said, until I have no breath left, which is pretty soon, uh, I'm going to advocate for medical aid and dying. And so um, now with the Oregon decision, the lawsuit kind of formed up and then we waited for the right time and then we um, filed the suit. And there was some quite a bit of publicity around filing the suit. And then this year, the the celebration win, um, or won, <laughs> we won, people won. So there were many celebrations about that. And that just made it a little bit easier. That's when I really got to know Dr. Barnard um, as we started doing a lot of media interviews together. And you get to know, you know, a person uh, surprisingly well on on um, Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so um, I I wanted to formalize my relationship with her because I don't want to go to Vermont and start, you know, from scratch. And uh, Kathy had a couple of missteps fighting a doctor who really wasn't willing to uh, help her with Act 39. So you have to... She, she warned me of all the things to beware of. Let's go back to when you were diagnosed. In 2018, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, I wasn't the least bit concerned about it. I don't know why, but I said they're going to fix it. It's it's early, and you know I I expected to have um, a lumpectomy and one and done band aid home, and I would be finished. Uh, I found out that uh, it was more extensive than that, and ended up in 2019 having uh, bilateral mastectomies. And I said, well, okay, now we're done. Uh, let's move on and get busy with with this almost gardening season. And then I had a diagnosis of uh, malignant melanoma. And again, I, I, I'm being, I, I just was in denial that this was serious, but I knew that if I got a doctor and I said, just cut everything out, just, you know, I don't want to take any radiation or chemo. You no, know, I just, let's get this done. So that was in 2019. I thought, well, okay, made it through. Time to go on a, on a great vacation. Went on a great vacation at the end of 2019. And we went to Memphis to hear all the great music. And and I thought, 2020 is my year to shine. And of course, it was the pandemic. And I had to just stay at home, just chomping at the bit to get back into the world and get busy again. And then in 2021, which is this diagnosis, is I just wasn't feeling well. I don't know how to put it. I, I'm thinking, gosh, I, I should, we're going to be opening up. Yeah, we're going to be opening up again. The, the country was starting to reopen in 2021. And, but I fell off, but I didn't know what it was. And then I finally said, well, it must be something in my gut. Let's go to see my gastroenterologist, which I did. And um, as soon as I described my symptoms, and I said, it was really nothing, but maybe diverticulitis, something like that. And so he said, well, let's get you a CAT scan, like tomorrow morning. I think, well, what's the big hurry? He goes, no, let's let's go. I want you to be in in, in the get a lab lab work tomorrow morning at six a.m. I want you to go to Quest. I'm thinking, wow, this is really he's getting serious over something that's not serious. I was completely oblivious. And this was on a Friday, and he sent me in. And of, of course, my lab work hadn't arrived yet, so they couldn't do the procedure. So I had the weekend off, and I'm still planning on what we're going to do and and where we're going to go. And Monday morning, I went back in for the CT scans. And about six o'clock at night. My husband and I are changing clothes. We're going to go maybe walk down to the beach. The phone rang and I looked at it and it said gastroenterology associates. I said, Paul, take that. That's just Mauer's office calling with reports, nothing. And my husband came back into the our bedroom where we're, and, and, and his eyes were red. His face was contorted. And he said, Linda, it's, it's not your gut. It's your ovaries. You have ovarian cancer and it's already spread. It's metastasized. And, and I, I just stood there and I put my arms around him and he put his arms around me and we hugged each other. He was sobbing. And I felt like if we if we let go of each other, we'd both fall down. And at the same time, I had this image of myself saying, 
with freedom, with like floating. And I th- I saw myself getting a time card and punching it and saying, I'm off the clock. I don't have to be responsible for things anymore. And so we we spent that night just kind of like bumping into walls, not we were so taken aback because this is cancer diagnosis number three. And now I'm saying for the first time, I really do have my mother's DNA. She, my mother had breast cancer. My mother had ovarian cancer. And my mother had leukemia and died in my arms in 1994. And hers was not a good death. And I kept saying, that's not me. I, I had so clearly had in my mind that somehow I didn't share the DNA with my mother. And yet here I was following in this third diagnosis. And I said, well, that I don't have much time, but I'm going to do death right and better than my mother did. I am going to leave my loved ones with memories of me that aren't the last memory I have of my mother which is of her curled up in this hospital bed that seemed huge. It might be like a baby in a crib, you know. And, and and she turned away from me. I think she was embarrassed to have me see her. And she had been embarrassed about her illness and how she looked and how weak she was. So she didn't, she wouldn't let me come visit. And she kept my brother and me both away because the the death part for her was grueling it was painful it was it took everything that made her the strong woman that i do uh disappear and so now with this new diagnosis i said i i've got to do differently and i i'm going to take charge of this and I, i have to do it now so as my husband and i sat there that night of the diagnosis which was the ides of march the 15th of march 2020 you know basically a a death sentence that is how i took my diagnosis and then i remembered i had my oncologist cell phone number from when i had breast cancer so i just texted him and i said you know neil this is linda b you know breast cancer and and melanoma and he's i said now i have ovarian cancer and they texted back can a girl catch a break and they said listen i'm on it half an hour later he texted back and he said, tomorrow morning, my nurse is going to call you with appointments. And so he got me immediately into uh, an appointment that same week with um, the head of gynecological oncology at Yale. And the whole process started. And that's when I lost control because now my calendar wasn't in, in my control. It was you have to have a COVID test and you have to have a blood test and you have a CAT scan and you have to have an X-ray and you have to, you know, do this and you have to have your primary care physician sign off on it. And, 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 and if you get all that stuff done in one week, then we're admitting you a week from today into Smilo in New Haven during COVID. And P.S., your husband drops you off at the front door and leaves. So that was how I got diagnosed. And it was a shock to the system. And it was the sense of loss of control that was almost the most terrifying thing I've ever known. As my husband drove me a week later to Smilo in in New Haven, he's looking at the out the steering, holding the steering wheel. So his hands were just, his knuckles were white, like he's facing a firing squad. He's driving me there. And I said, now listen, you're going to have to get more death certificates than they're going to give you. They're going to only offer you three, but get at least 10 because you're going to need those. And then I said, and you need a new cell phone. And I'm going to write a note here to the Verizon store. I'm trying to, I'm trying to finish up as much unfinished business because neither he nor I really expected me to survive that surgery. That sense of panic is palpable in what you're describing. So you went in for a surgery and I can only imagine how lonely that must have been, you know, being isolated in the hospital without family around. So you came out of surgery and and then what happened? I was in ICU for four days. They couldn't uh, stabilize me. It turned out to be a pump, but not me. But anyhow, we got it all fixed. And then they put me in an ambulance and sent me over to St. Raphael's, which was a hospital that had been closed and they reopened it for COVID. So it was a recovery floor now, but nothing was set up. So uh, the experience of being in the hospital through April, I went home on April Fool's Day after the surgery. 
they didn't even have call lights or somebody at the desk. They didn't weren't staffed. So every morning a nurse would write her name on a whiteboard at the end of my bed with her cell phone and say, it's easier, just call the cell phone. So I'm, I find myself in places where I, I can't get to my cell phone. I say, oh, whose cell phone do I have to call to get somebody to come in? It was very isolating. I decided, gee, I'm here on my own. I better just romance this a little bit. So the next morning when in the in the new hospital, I'm five days post-op, and Doctor Azotis, all of his residents and fellows come in to examine me because it's a you know it's a teaching hospital, and I have a rare disease. So they said, "How are you feeling?" I said, "Well, the thread count on these sheets violates the Geneva Conventions. I'm sure about it." <laughs> they looked at me. And they said, "You're joking." And I said, "No, you try to sleep on this. This is a labor and delivery bed. I'm 74 years old, and you you have me sleeping on this awful." bed and, and I said the windows are filthy I, I want to get out of the, I, I feel like robbing the housekeeper's cart you know so I can look out and so that became my sort of way of dealing with it and so the day that they told me that I'd been in the hospital for eight days and on the ninth day I could have a visitor so I the nurse said oh this is really going to be good for you you can call that husband of yours who's been calling every day and tell him he could come visit I said hmm I want, you know, DoorDash or Grubhub. I want somebody to bring me food. <laughs> she said, you're kidding. And I said, no, all you feed me is jello and broth. And it was awful. <laughs> so, but I, I got through it, you know, and part of my upbringing was whatever it is, is just deal with what you have and don't be hoping for something better or, or pining away for the stuff that you don't have. I knew I wasn't going to have a, you know, regular diet because they took it, you know, a foot of my colon out when they, they did the surgery. So, I was well aware that I was a sick puppy, and but I could still make some people laugh. And so a lot, I had a lot of a lot of visitors come, and I was introduced to palliative care. So I had a, a massage therapist who came in every day to rub my shoulders and my feet, and a chaplain, and I had my palliative care doctor. And I said, I just want to know the truth. Now, can you tell me? She says, well, there's going to be a tumor board. And I said, just please go and find out how much time I have because nobody will t tell me that. That's what I really want to know. And uh, she came in and she said, do you still want to have that conversation? I said, I absolutely do. It's very important to me. And she said, well, um, I think you might see, you might be able to see your garden next year. But I have a April birthday. She didn't promise me that I'd get to my birthday. So I said, okay, I, I know what I have to do. I have to go home and I have to get well and I have to start planning to die. And, and that was it. And I was discharged on April 1st and then had a wound infection. So I they wanted me to start chemotherapy immediately because I had a very bad surgery and a bad prognosis, but they wanted to get me on chemo right away to see if I could get a remission. So I had to go through all of the dysfunctional lack of a healthcare system that we have. So it, it was not a happy recovery, but friends started visiting and writing messages and chalk on my driveway and bringing balloons and all kinds of visits. And then at the end of the month of April, I started on April 30th, I started chemotherapy and uh, went through six cycles or one course of chemotherapy, which took me through the summer. And it was it took a lot out of me. It, you know, gave me peripheral neuropathy in my hands and my feet, my hair. I was sick. I was tired. There were a lot of things, but I was eager to get out of it. And I did get a remission of almost a year. So I had until uh, 2022 that, uh, man, my husband, we left no stone unturned about these are things that I have. I won't say a bucket list, but I will say things that I hadn't paid attention to the time that I needed to say, set aside for doing things and more family time, more visits from my son and my granddaughter, you know, more uh, going out with friends, more music playing, more everything there. You're listening to Voices of the Completed Life, a podcast brought to you by the Completed Life Initiative. Learn more about the Completed Life Initiative and donate to our cause at www dot completed life dot org we provide groundbreaking presentations about the right to control one's own end-of-life experience we explore legislative options for expanding the eligibility criteria for medical aid in dying within the united states and look to other countries around the globe in support of the right to die we empower people to ask 
What does it mean to live a completed life? Spread the word about the completed life on social media by using hashtag completed life. And now, back to our episode. Let's go back to an earlier beginning, earlier than these past months and years, to learn about your growing up. What sorts of things influenced your beliefs over time as a young child, then as an adolescent, and then as an adult? Two growing up places were important. I was born in San Marcos, Texas, and was raised for my first six years uh, on a cattle ranch in way south Texas, 80 miles south of San Antonio. I had uh, everything I needed. I had cats and dogs and chickens and uh, horses and things to do. As a little girl, I didn't have any friends because I was the baby of the family. And my mother, my grandmother, my Aunt Frances were all teachers at the school. And my brother went to the school. So I was home alone with the housekeeper and uh, my imagination and uh, a lot of dry land and uh, things to do. And in 1953, financial fortunes changed for my family in South Texas. And my father and mother were able to uh, make a move immediately to Southern California. And so for the first time in my life at age six and a half, I went to school and was around other children. And uh, there were curbs and there were green lawns and things I'd never seen before. Uh, Grocery stores, um, things like that were exciting. My father and mother were told by my aunt and uncle who lived in Whittier, California, oh, get a house in Anaheim because we hear Disney is going to put up a park there. And I thought a park like a swing set and (laughs) maybe a couple of slides that a other toys to play on swings, but especially I wanted. So we moved to into a house and this whole long street was full of kids my age. So that was where I grew up and got my values. I mean, in, in those days, we, we had church was on Sunday and Wednesday night and we had youth group and we had summer camp. Then Disneyland opened in 1955, and I was there because all the kids in Sunday school in Anaheim got an invitation to go to Disneyland on opening day. So that was kind of cool, and Disney played a big part in my growing up because it was the company town, and I loved Disneyland. I mean, to say that this was an influence on my life is just too small of a role it played because the Disney values were burned into my soul. And I I couldn't wait to be 15 and a half and get a job there like everybody else did. And I believed that it was safety and courtesy and show. And you had to just inculcate those values. And I mean, I bought into this whole Disney philosophy of, of guest relations, and it has stayed with me my whole life. And Disney took everything, he romanced every idea, because he said his first idea of Disneyland came when he was watching his daughters play at a regular amusement park and the adults all looked bored to death and there were it was strewn with cigarette butts and you know trash and things like that and he wanted to have the same amusement park but make it romance it you know make it a theme park make it fantasy land and Mr. Toad's Wild Ride or make it uh, the Jungle Cruise but I got the idea there's everything can be improved by paying attention to the storytelling and you can romance anything and make it wonderful you mentioned a a church group what kind of of church by the time we were in california we're, we're from a large irish catholic family but but my mother got involved with the church of christ which is a fundamentalist um, that was where we had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night youth group. I mean, all that stuff was, it was a really big deal to my parents' church. In Texas was a huge deal because there was no opera, no movies. I mean, so if you were going to have entertainment, it had to be a church. Uh, California, it didn't nearly match up to my Disneyland church. I just took church as a necessary evil in my life because I thought it was boring. And I also believed that as a young child, it couldn't possibly be true 
because the Church of Christ, you know, talked about who was, they seemed to know who was going to heaven and who was going to hell. And I didn't believe it <laughs> for a second because I had lots of friends of different religions. I couldn't make that same leap. So I went along with it, but I was, I tried really, really hard to love Jesus. And I couldn't, I could, I could love my parents and my grandparents and my aunts and my uncles and my friends. I, I couldn't figure out how to make that other leap. It just didn't happen. And I wanted it to. I, I once I would I would go to church and then I would I would go home and I would preach a sermon to my dolls. I'd line them all up and then I would baptize them all. And uh, and I like playing church, but I didn't like going to church. Growing up, was there any particular attitude or perspective on death when you were young? It was pretty in Texas. It was pretty obvious. People were laid out in their living rooms. There wasn't a funeral parlor in town, so that when someone would die, we would go by the house, and there would be somebody on a bench or whatever. I didn't know what they were on, but they were, you know, laying quite dead. And I was pretty curious about it. It wasn't necessarily fearful. I said that it was his cattle ranch, and we had chickens, and so we ate our food, and. I understood death was part of living. Some people were food and some people weren't food. <laughs> um, my cats weren't food, but the chickens were. <laughs> and and certainly the beef cattle were and the deer. And so death was just part of life. And people, you know, my father lost his father when he was just six years old to tuberculosis. And there had been, you know, my, my parents had come through the time when there were illnesses for which there were, you know, smallpox in my mother's family. My mother's older sister went to teach school in South Texas and brought smallpox home and killed, it infected her twin sisters who also died. My father's family had tuberculosis. And, and so the, my grandmother lost her husband and her baby, my father's little brother, in the same week. So death was just it happened and children died and old people died. It was better if it, they were old before they died. But I grew up with death as something that was part of life. How have your views on death changed over the years? It just matured like an adult vision of death. It became more real when you had family members who began to die. And I never used the term pass away or, you know, went on, or, you know, I I knew that uh, I had a, my mother's mother uh, was in a nursing home, and it looked like an awful place to be. So I was pretty happy when I learned that she died, because I couldn't imagine living there. And I, I was very matter of fact about that. And there were always people who had losses in their family, and how they reacted to it was something of curiosity to me more than fear so much is like, gee, some people really have a hard time with this, you know, that I, you know, go get their pet chicken and, and make it Sunday dinner and see what it feels like. But that's, I think, growing up in where I did, I was much more conversant with issues of life and death. Death is, is just part of the bargain of living. And I, my grandmother, who is my theologian, always said that. Still on the topic of religion, but bringing it back to medical aid and dying, have people raised the idea of, quote unquote, redemptive suffering in response to your decision? How do you feel about that? Yes. Well, first of all, they, the opponents always talk about why do you want to commit suicide? And I say, I don't. People who don't want to live commit suicide or try. I would love to keep living. I just can't. That's beyond, that's in my DNA. So let's start with there. And the second thing is you can't have it both ways. You can't have a loving and compassionate image of this God who wants you to suffer longer and longer for the opportunity to get closer and closer. That's not my religion. And we live in a pluralistic society. I am a Unitarian Universalist. And for my faith, we were the very first denomination to take a stand on medical aid and dying in 1988. The UUA passed a resolution at General Assembly in support of agency in dying. And the Oregon passed the first law uh, in the nation for medical aid and dying, and it was all formed in the meeting rooms at the First Unitarian Church in Portland. And so it, it's in my faith. So when 
opponents want to use their position as legislators of their vision of God, and I haven't been elected. I don't have anybody elected to you know, present my position. Maybe we ought to keep religion out of it and say, you don't have to violate any of your religious principles or beliefs, however you believe about redemptive suffering, but that is not my belief. And that is not my faith. And that is not the the faith of the clergy who are going to be surrounding me in compassionate and, and loving care as I move closer to the day when I will take flight. So don't don't use man's laws to try to legislate God's business. It's 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 presumptive and arrogant. Now I'd like to take the last few minutes of this interview to talk about what a completed life means to you. Previously, you've referenced a death plan. Do you mind elaborating on what your plan entails? Oh, Kathy and I talked about this a lot. The first thing uh, that we both put separately, we didn't even know we were both doing death plans, but we did them together. Uh, and, and we said, forgive everyone. That you cannot go into a completed life with all this baggage. You got to leave it at the train station. You got these two heavy suitcases. You can't catch. But it, the the metaphor that I used was: I'm trying to get on that coming train, and it's pulling into the station. But I've got this heavy bag of regrets and you know unfinished business with people I love, and it, I can't run and catch that train and move on. So I have to just drop those bags and run and get on that that next transition. And so she said, yes. And she said, I did the same thing. And she told me about, you know, forgiving her housekeeper on, you know, on the post road in Fairfield one day. She says, oh, I've got to forgive you. I got that on my list. And the second thing is to make yourself as educated as possible about the disease. Know everything about the, the natural course of the disease that you have. And the third is to know all the medical possibilities, you know, get, get not only know the natural course of your disease, but know what interventions and what the pluses and minuses of them are. And then on your death plan, you want to get all your business taken care of. I have a prepaid for the disposition of my body and burial, which is not burial. I didn't want to be buried. I wanted, I tried to have a green burial, but it turned out to be harder than you could imagine in the state of Connecticut. In Colorado, you can compost yourself, but that didn't happen here. So I have my cremation prepaid, and I have uh, updated all of my trust funds and my my wills. And then I said, I don't want to leave just money to my grandchildren. I don't want them to think, you know, grandma died and, you know, pay for my college, blah, blah, blah. I left a values and wisdom will. So I worked for months to write a will, leaving them the values that I've had that have guided my life. And so that was really important to me to as part of my paperwork. And then I'm working on a new one, which is just common sense stuff that kids don't often learn that I want to leave to my children and to my grandchildren. And I have another thing, which is making all these connections with people who have meant so much to me. And I call it my dead letter project. So during all of my illness, my hospitalization, and, and all this publicity, I get cards from people all over. I mean, people have found me, you know, my college roommate, you know, and beyond. So I have all the cards, and I take the card, and I cut the picture part of it off, and on the back, I write, it meant so much for you to reach out to me. I want you to know that I want to thank you. You were part of my life. And I wish you the well. I put it in an envelope. And when I die, my husband will mail those. So they get their own card back. <laughs> so um, that's a- another part of just planning ahead of time. And then, of course, to get all of the who do I want to be with me and how do I want my last days to go. And to be really clear about uh, how this ending for me is it not an ending so much as a transition? You know, it's I'm, I'm going to close the door on this form and open to whatever my next form is. And I don't know what that is. Nobody knows. I've made a promise to uh, do that for my family. And I see 
And this last Thanksgiving, I had family meeting with my children, my grandchildren, my husband. We all talked about, I said, I think this is the year grandma, next year's grandma's going to probably die. And so let's talk about that. And I don't want any secrets. No, everybody has a chance to say what their feelings are. And the more we get it out, the less power it has to to immobilize us. Does it mean that sad goes away? It means that we've taken the good from this passing of form and this transition. So um, we had a very interesting conversation with my teenage granddaughters as they, they shared how terrified they were and how saddened and how destabilizing it was when their 20-year-old cousin died in a car accident last year in Montana, a uh, head-on car crash. Well, I said, see, that's not like grandma. You know, you, you, know, you had no preparation for, for when your cousin died and how shocking that was. And that's not what I want for you or for all of us. I want you to hold on to each other. And uh, so we, we talked about that. And, and so I feel like I'm, I'm closing many circles I guess the last part of it is, you know, of my death plan is remember, this is all the time you have. Carpe the diem and make a list of priorities and make sure you honor those and honor yourself in the priorities. Do what you can, be who you are, and don't get too attached to the outcomes because it may not turn out like I want. So if it doesn't, that's part of the plan too, because none of us have that much control, but we do know how to prepare for a number of eventualities perhaps it won't be this way or that way i don't want to be too determined it's like i've always had a feeling and i was in a um, cancer support group with all terminal patients and we were talking about how we hated the word hope hope is like kind of removing you're being present in the in what you can control with with some magical thing that's going to happen out there, and so when um, the facilitator of our group was talking about well, what keeps you hoping, and we go, no, we don't like that word, and she was really surprised that um, we had that reaction to we're present. This is what it is. We're good with that. We may not be happy with it. It may not be, have been our choice, but it is. And we, we're going to deal with what we have, not with what may be or might be. We're, we're going to do as much as we can to be fully present until we can't be. Do I want to be all, you know, morphined out, you know, at my last? No, I don't want to be that. I really want to have the opportunity to, to have that prescription handy to say, you know what? I think when I go to sleep, I don't want to wake up again. And then I learned from Kathy that I hadn't thought about before, you don't want to take it at bedtime because then the body's laying there all night, right? That's hard on your family. So she chose to take flight at 10 a.m. in the morning so they could get on with, you know, uh, saying their goodbyes to her corporal self and having someone come and take that away and then perhaps going out for coffee or walk, a good long walk. So I said, yeah, you, you don't want to make this a nighttime thing. So that's something that I hadn't, I had to learn from following in Kathy's footsteps. You know, as you're, you're sharing, I'm thinking back to when you shared about Disney and Mm -hmm. kind of the, the joy that that brought you and, and your friends and, and how and a form of entertainment is often an illusion of creating this this temporary experience and yet mm-hmm. that is fully present and that's something that I'm recognizing is a theme within your death plan of you want mm-hmm. to be fully present and not hopeful of something that is not really grounded in in truth death is not optional i think of of it as uh you you need to reconcile yourself with the fullness of life. You've celebrated a birth, now the fullness of it will be in your death. And let that be as celebrated as your life, your entrance into this world has been. So uh, that's my that's my parting thought. I hope I can live that out uh, into the, the reality of uh, the next few months. And uh, I'm still continuing to lobby for medical aid in dying. The bill in Connecticut this year, which is SB 1076, it made it out of public health committee and it's back in judiciary. So we'll see what 
legislative games they will play, or maybe they'll just play it straight and let the whole General Assembly vote on the bill. Give democracy a chance. If this is now a justice issue. I am, you know, currently today the only person in the entire world who can go to Vermont and access aid and dying without becoming a resident. But that's a justice issue. Mm -hmm. You know, not everybody has, you know, a husband who's a physician who can go with me and take care of me and or the the income to be able to allow me to, you know, pick up and rent a place in Vermont for six months or whatever. So Vermont hopefully will pass its bill to remove entirely the residency requirement from aid and dying. And hopefully that will cause other states to also remove the residency requirement. Just as Connecticut's going to pass one with a residency requirement and a waiting period just to add insult to injury. You know, Compassionate Choices before this legislative session had a photo gallery of all the people who died in the last year waiting for medical aid and dying with their family members holding their portraits saying, you didn't pass this in time for my husband, my son, my daughter my mother, how could, that's what Kathy and I talked about so often, how could we not use our illness to do something, to leave a legacy of advocacy, if nothing else, to talk about fulfilling the completed life, that would just, well, smugness isn't really a nice thing, but <laughs> it would it would give me great satisfaction, perhaps, uh, to know that I had it, I had the opportunity, and I took it. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to make a difference, and um, my unfinished business is not going to be a long list, that's for sure. You just heard the story of Linda Shannon Bluestein. We would like to congratulate Linda for her historic settlement in Vermont. Following the recording of this episode, Vermont Governor Phil Scott signed House Bill 190 into law on May 2, 2023. With this landmark action, Vermont became the first state in the U.S. to pass legislation that permits medical aid and dying services to qualifying patients regardless of the state in which they legally reside. This is a landmark moment in the Right to Die movement and will hopefully open the door to further changes in legislation and increased access to medical aid in dying. We would also like to thank Linda for her continued and vital advocacy work in her home state of Connecticut. Linda's story has previously been written about in various publications. If you would like to read the New York Times piece that covered the Bluestein settlement, it is linked in the description of this episode. If you would like to share a response to Linda Shannon Bluestein's story, please feel free to reach out to us on our social media platforms, at Completed Life. Additionally, if you are interested in sharing your story of a completed life on this podcast, whether for yourself or a loved one, please reach out to us via email at Info at completedlife.org. This has been Voices of the Completed Life. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us at www.completedlife.org. That's completedlife.org where you'll find extensive video content regarding resources on aid and dying featuring discussions led by expert clinicians, bioethicists, policymakers, and end-of-life doulas. At the Completed Life Initiative, we advocate for a person's right to direct their own end-of-life care. Take control over your transition. Your life. Your choice. <laughs>